Welcome back. It is my privilege to introduce the speaker for the next session on physical and geopolitical environment affecting capital flows and markets. And it's an understatement when I say that we are delighted to welcome Daniel J. Fuss, who is the vice chairman at Loomis Sales and Company as the speaker for this session. Anybody familiar with the fixed income markets or otherwise will instantly recognize this name. He is a legend in the fixed income market. In the year 2000, he was named to the Fixed Income Analyst Society's Hall of Fame in recognition of his contribution towards the analysis of fixed income securities and portfolios. Welcome, Dan. This uh, session will be moderated by B. Prasanna, who is Group Head Global Markets, Sales Trading and Research at ICICI Bank. Prasanna is also the chairman of ICICI Securities Primary Dealership or ISEC PD, as it's commonly referred to, as well as the vice chairman of the Fixed Income Money Market and Derivatives Association of India, which is FIMDA. Welcome, Prasanna. Over to you. And we are all ears for this keenly awaited session. Uh, 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 over to Dan and Prasanna. All right, well, first of all, thank you for having me. As, as I uh, look out the window here, I see a raging blizzard, and that is the introduction to the markets these days, in a sense. Uh, the, we're wrapping this quick analysis in the cocoon of everything happening around us. First is obviously uh, the COVID situation, and next is the uh, the climate we live in, both physically and geopolitically, which is extremely important in looking not only at the investment markets themselves, but in dealing with individual credits. Uh, and that's, that's our framework. Inside that, we have to look at the individual markets, the economies, very importantly, the central bank activities, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And that's uh, quite in play here in the U.S. at, at the moment. So let's get started here. Um, the climate and geopolitics. Climate, I believe you're all aware of the consequences of the climate change. Uh, it, the investment markets cannot take all of this into account on a day-to-day -day or near-term basis, but nevertheless are quite aware of it on what I would call the individual areas affected, which are very, very, very different as you move around the world. Here in the U.S., it's areas in the country, and it starts to feed into many, many, many other things. Uh, that affect not only our markets, but our individual issue selection these days. Um, the, on the geopolitics side, the, the need for cooperation to deal with some of the risks in the world, primarily climate, but also the other stresses that we have and the individual methods of government, uh, I have to be uh, quite careful in what I say in this area, but uh, they all uh, influence the security selection process. Things that we thought were normal four years ago for individual credits in the United States are no longer viewed as normal because the world is changing. It's changing rather fast. and. Uh, the markets have not completely been catching up with that. The, um, it's a difficult uh, situation because we're looking, to be frank, at various types of disagreements between countries that are somewhat unique to the modern day and uh, falling under the uh, area of uh, physical activity of war um, hopefully, 
uh, we will not trend very far that way, but the stresses, the so-called threats of a Thucydides trap where two powers, in this case the U.S. and China, get caught in a situation where they, the natural momentum of things starts to carry them forward towards a very serious clash. Now, in this world of modern armaments, that's a game over situation. And that we have to be very, very careful of. And there's no effective way that we can possibly, uh, possibly deal with an investment portfolio that protects from that. However, the other forms, some of which are in play right now, uh, most recently between the United States and Russia, um, are affecting what we do and what the risk setting that those things are in is. And, and that's, that is seldom, if ever, seen in most risk analyses, but it has to come into our vision and into our thinking these days, because when it does in a more serious matter, then it's a little bit too late. Markets adjust. Um, the supply chain changes that are going on right now are formidable. Um, here in the U.S., it's fairly easy to see where things, and this started uh, long before the current day. This started really with the floods uh, on the southern coast of Thailand here seven years ago or so, um, where we started in North America to see the vulnerability uh, to certain of the production items, uh, in that case, hard drives for computers and several other things, auto parts, auto production, uh, were affected by floods halfway around the world. Uh, as a result, there's been a shift gradually, barely without notice, until you get uh, until we've advanced in time in the supply chain. Where are things taken from the raw material to the first stage of production and so forth through? Now this is all physical production. It doesn't affect distribution once you get to the final market when it's all, the product is all assembled, but it is causing major disruption in the physical supply chain and an awareness of this and uh, by the manufacturing and distributing companies. And th this is impact, it's knocked some of the suppliers uh, who could not cope with this change out of business. It is affecting, uh, production along the supply chain here in the U.S., some very positively, some very negatively. The pace of innovation has picked up. That's the most important thing I can say these days about the credit side. Innovation, not just in physical production, but innovation in, uh, in distribution, uh, most notable here in the U.S. with the COVID. Um, the domestic politics, I won't linger on, but it's important to say that the divisions happening uh, in, in the U.S., the ones that I'm most observant of, are rather remarkable and, quite frankly, disheartening. Um, and hopefully we'll now start to mend, although it will be uh, some time. This impacts the money markets, it impacts the capital markets, it impacts really the role of our central bank. Um, and it's, it's not supposed to run that way. Also impacting the role of our central bank and all cent other central banks is where we stand in the economies. The economy right now in the, in the US and in uh, Europe, certainly, uh, and in parts of Asia, is, is has been disrupted. Um, we are now uh, here in the U.S. We were in something that looked like a recovery that stopped, and uh, we're now in what hopefully is just uh, a deep stutter.
fully uh, back on a, an increase in production and supply and consumer demand over the next few months. This is being slowed down by our own legislature. I think as of this morning, they've gotten over that. Uh, and, uh, but it, it's still, it's a difficult time and it's hitting hard in Europe right now. And uh, so that, that sort of pressure on the capital markets is actually to raise more money because companies have obligations to meet, some of which through employee attrition or stopping uh, the purchase of goods, they can handle. Uh, others, uh, they can't, what they owe uh, debtors. There's been a lagged effect on the capital markets in regards to ability to pay, but it's now starting up again. And so as a result, companies that are large enough to access the capital markets as opposed to the local bank uh, are coming to market increasingly with one new issue after another for as long a maturity as the market will focus on, which is in general, the five year, maybe eight year area and a few of the long, in the long end. The Fed, our central bank is well aware of this. And they've been doing their very best to keep the capital markets liquid. Uh, this started in the spring. It didn't cost uh, the Fed as much money as they thought it would cost. They were able to pull back a bit while their very presence as the bid side of the market encouraged people. In fact, in a sense, it forced people into the fixed income markets, depending on their mandates. So much of the money here in the US is highly sensitive to indices of one sort or another, fixed income, the various types of indices. Um, and people do not want to fall short of the return on that index. They would like to exceed it, but they certainly don't want to fall short of it. So even though they see uh, an unsatisfactory credit situation going forward. If the issue is large enough, they will feel compelled to have part of it in the portfolio. That's one part. The other part is leverage money, hedge funds, whatever you want to call it, that comes in and buys and then later distributes, depending on the liquidity of the market. And so far, that approach has been quite successful. Now, this is where we go to the worrisome side. Um, I should mention with the central banks, uh, Europe is even more the case. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I won't linger on that. Um, the level of rates is at all time lows. Here in the US, certainly in Europe and in many other parts of the world. The liquidity uh, in and around the center of the market is as good as I've ever seen it. Uh, there is a push, a drive into the market to keep this going so that nobody, you know, nobody wants to fall behind in this type of situation. Now, there are exceptions to that. Uh, there are people who have... Uh, been seeing this setting, not running uh, money that is tightly constrained to the indices that have uh, started uh, shifting away from this confidence in the market. They tend to be people with long memories who have experienced this before, perhaps not in this exact form, but uh, very close to it. Uh, starting certainly in the 60s and uh, the worst market ever in 73, 74, uh, and uh, several times in this century. So um, the warning flags are up. The timing is highly uncertain and whether or not this will be a gradual adjustment in the markets to a more uh, realistic view in reference to the environment we're in, 
Uh, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. It may just gradually drift away. I doubt it. Uh, the amount of leverage in the market in various products uh, by anecdotal evidence is enormous. Uh, and it's one way to add to an otherwise very low return. And that that is worrisome. Uh, it makes it very difficult with a forecast here. And if the central bank support would waver at all, then people would get very concerned. So far, the central bank in the United States and in Europe, but the United States reinforced their previous uh, statements by saying yesterday, uh, saying, all right, folks, don't worry about it. We're still here. And then to keep people who are worried about ultimate inflation, they added that they too are concerned with that, but they don't see it on the near-term horizon. Now, here comes the key question. At what point, when they look out, do they see the emergence of inflation? Anybody keeping an index of the housing prices in the suburbs of a major metropolitan area, uh, New York City, Boston, oh my goodness. Uh, it says, what, what do you mean about inflation in the future? Inflation is now. These prices have ramped up sharply, but that's because people are leaving the major central cities in, in not just New York and Boston, try Chicago, try the West Coast in the United States, try London, in England. Uh, that's one type of price adjustment. The price adjustment for certain uh, types of services in the current setting uh, of COVID uh, is adjusted up a lot. For others, gone down, depends on what it is. That is not the kind of inflation that the Fed is looking at. They're looking at more fundamental inflation for goods, services, and the cost of employing people. Uh, and there's a strong argument that though some of those costs will lag as we've learned to automate far, far, far more right now. All of this wraps into the credit assessment. Now, the other factor in running the fixed income portfolios is not just the credit assessment, it's what are the prices in the secondary market that are uniformly, nine out of 10, comfortably above issue price, comfortably above par. And uh, so that makes portfolio construction rather easy. Uh, not easy, excuse me, quite the reverse, rather difficult. Um, the risk is very easy to spot. The reinvestment risk is actually lower now because interest rates are so low that the odds favor higher rates in the future. Uh, the credit risk has gone up enormously. And uh, that's where we have to focus nearly 100% of our efforts right now is a one by one calculation of how is this particular issuer, whether it be in uh, the high yield market, the investment grade market, a little less worry in most cases, the structured product area, again, a broad variety of, of risk in there. Um, if, if the payback is tied to uh, airline uh, activity or something like that, then you, you obviously have some uh, very easy to see uh, adverse possibilities. Um, the, the last piece before I, I hand things over here is, uh, is right now uh, on the currency side, there's, there's both risk and a safer element. From our view uh, here in the U.S. for U.S.-based portfolios and uh, in other parts of the world uh, where it's, they're based in whatever the, that 
particular currency is, um, it's important to point out that uh, the reserve currencies uh, really have to be watched because they, by and large, uh, the principal reserve currencies are in a fairly you know, bad relative to each other. Uh, some, some, or one in particular, Swiss franc, is, is being pushed constantly on the upside to the point its central bank is worried. Uh, the dollar uh, central bank's not too worried about because many others adjust to it. But that is a key point. And so a mismatch between where your, your money needs to be and needs to eventually be spent and uh, a different currency is more important now than it's been during more quiet times. And that, that is the very fast overview. Now, uh, I'm very anxious to uh, have our moderator here uh, put me, uh, Prasanna will gently put me through the hoops and uh, and we'll do a question and answer, and then there will be question and answer with the others. So uh, thank you for listening to the monologue and Prasanna. Uh, <laughs> remember, you're talking to a man sitting in the middle as I look out the window of one of the worst, in fact, the worst blizzard in the last five years here. <laughs> Over to you, Prasanna. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, that was a, a lovely uh, talk about uh, uh, the global uh, economy, the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, things that are happening. So uh, I have picked up uh, a few uh, points from what you spoke, and I have a few questions of my own, which I thought I will uh, kind of uh, put it on to you because uh, people in India will be uh, a, a, a lot interested in some of the topics which uh, I will probably be uh, raising with you. So some of the points that I picked up from your speech, which I thought is very, very important and relevant for a lot of us here as well, is about uh, at uh, what point uh, do you think uh, that the, there will be an emergence of inflation? So I think that's a very, very important uh, question that you uh, posted. Uh, the second uh, was about uh, housing inflation versus goods and services inflation, and that the Fed is possibly going to look at uh, the, a more fundamental type of inflation. I think that was the other important point that you made. Then, of course, you made the point about um, uh, a lot of money actually uh, chasing uh, assets, uh, primarily because of uh, it being included in index. So I guess that's uh, something that is uh, important for us all to remember. You talked about credit risk as well. I mean, there is going to be a substantial amount of increase in the credit risk that we see in the market. And um, I think then you, in the initial part of your speech, you made about uh, the disagreements between the various countries and the geopolitical uh, uh, reasons as to why the markets will uh, be a little tentative. So Dan, let me uh, then ask you a few specific uh, questions which you might not have directly, you know, touched upon in your uh, speech. Uh, so the first uh, is on the general aspect about uh, the sweet spot that the markets seem to be experiencing, which is today, uh, you know, uh, people are uh, uh, having a lot of money coming in from the central banks, uh, pump priming uh, that they are doing in terms of releasing money into the system. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of hope has come back into the market that post the vaccine, the economy is going to improve a lot. And this period, I call it as a sweet spot because where, while there is a hope that uh, the economy will get better, the central banks are not going to, you know, relent giving money or stop giving money just because there is a hope. They are probably going to wait to see it in actual data. So in the next three to four months, you're possibly going to see the best of both worlds, which is the hope playing out as well as money playing out. So 
what is your opinion about how um, a, a market a person managing money should uh, handle uh, at this particular point of time well let's start right there with that point um because that is the catch 22 in this market much of it depends on your size to the degree that you are small and flexible relative to the market and uh, not leveraged, then you can say, all right, I'm going to go along with this. And um, as a sub question to that, okay, go along to what point? And for that matter, what flexibility do you have on disengaging from the market? Uh, that that is critical do you have uh, a structure uh, such as a, some type of liability match uh, that uh, means you have to keep your uh, duration and your spread along the duration line uh, fairly well balanced no matter what then you you grit your teeth and you say all right i'm gonna stay with this uh, the, to the degree that you are not tied over shorter periods of time uh, to the market, then you would have, you would hold whatever your circumstances might be, what would be called uh, a normal plus short-term liquid reserve. In the case of the U.S., you'd be holding uh, treasury bills and notes out through the fear right now, but you'd have a spread along there so that you could very quickly respond both to the markets, but also to the building needs of the clients in that category, such okay. as many right now of our clients uh, whose business is being adversely affected are public sector clients who are suffering a very sharp drop in their own revenues and have an employee base that has heavier demands on it. Those are the, the catch-22 type situations. Now, if you're beyond that and you can say, all right, I have a fair amount of, uh, and still with a moderate amount of money, I have a, a fair amount of flexibility, I can leverage up to a certain point, then I would increase the focus on liquidity, but perhaps increase the leverage a bit. Um, now, the bulk of the monies that we run fall into two categories, uh, mutual funds and employee pension and profit sharing and so forth, uh, retirement funds. Uh, we also do run some money, uh, quite a bit of it actually, uh, for various governmental units around the world. Uh, so uh, there we're cautious. Uh, we, uh, there is no way without substantial leverage that you can ever meet the uh, levels that are hoped for in a, a public sector retirement plan um, to find benefit. You just can't, you can't meet that. Okay. Uh, sure. And uh, so, so number one, you just have to say, okay, we have an unreasonable match here between the required duration and, and return and the capital market. You cannot meet them in the capital markets. That drives money out of the public markets into the private yeah. markets, where the, uh, the returns are assumed, and so they can continue with their normal. Unfortunately, the returns in many areas of the private markets have not been up to the level assumed because they are also dragged down by the lower level of rates. Okay. All right. Okay. Sure. Uh, Makes sense. I think your other questions were subsumed yeah. under that. Yeah, that's right. 
uh, so Dan, I'm also getting a lot of questions from the audience uh, relating to uh, the equity market and uh, 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 and whether we are in a bubble and things like that. So I know that I mean you uh, track fixed income and currencies uh, very very closely. So I won't really ask you a direct question on equity markets, but uh, what okay. I will ask you, but what I will ask you is this: um, the fundamental reason why uh, emerging markets have been uh, getting in a lot of capital flows in the last three months is, of course, a because of the uh, hope that the recovery would be very good in the next year. But more importantly, it's also because of a weak view, uh, a, a, a dollar weakening view, the view that a dollar is going to get into a fundamental weakness over the next uh, year or so, with some uh, research houses kind of uh, predicting even a 20% uh, depreciation of the dollar from where we are. And as we speak, uh, the dollar X actually crossed uh, 90, fell below 90 yesterday uh, from around 97, 98 uh, some time ago. Uh, so, uh, do you think what what's your view on the dollar going forward and do you think uh, if the dollar if you subscribe to the view of a weakening dollar so do you think that a lot of money is going to come into emerging markets uh, because we all know in india that uh, when money comes into the emerging market space india will get a big share of uh, that space as well so I think you can address it from that perspective, your view on dollar and view on flows into the emerging markets. Oh, uh, normally you wind up uh, with bricks being thrown at you because you, I will tend to be wrong in that. But right now I have a, a fairly strong view uh, that the dollar was in about a three, three and a half year overshoot uh, for a a broad variety of, of reasons. Um, that's over. The dollar is now drifting down. Um, my my short-term guess is the dollar uh, against a broader selection of currencies it has about another three four percent before the. Uh, it worries the central bank. Now, I, I want to spend just one minute here, if I can. An important part of my education uh, achieved when I was uh, in my late 30s is I happened to report directly to uh, a very famous Fed chairman right after he retired from the Fed, uh, William McChesney Martin. So I would get a weekly tutorial from him. First, uh, never get overconfident in my ability to forecast or his. <laughs> but it is very, 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 it's critical for the, in the U.S. for the central bank to always be aware of the dollar because the first mandate that was given the central bank, uh, well, the very first one was keep the banking system going across the country because there used to be a problem with that transfer of funds. Okay. But their first order of priority was to defend against inflation. The second order of priority added after his uh, tenure was to promote employment. Okay, now, here's where you get to the crux of things, though. Uh, if you're going to defend against inflation, uh, the monetarist argument that was so strong in the 60s, in the year I was reporting to him, was 1971. The monetarist argument uh, uh, that was uh, talked about by many, many people, the University of Chicago thesis was, you've got to stop inflation. Now, Mr. Martin pointed out something very fundamentally adjunct to that. You also have to be very, very aware as a central bank that even though your 
primary function is to defend against inflation, keep the banking system going, defend against inflation, help employment now, it's my addition. You also have to be aware that when there are extraordinary demands on the U.S. Treasury, you have to take that into account. Whether or not you have a formal accord, as we did uh, from the late 30s into the early 50s uh, during World War II and then for a ways after, or whether you have the common accord on what your purpose is in this world. And that is, if you have an overwhelming risk right now to the nation, uh, and keeping in mind the rest of the world, then you have to say, all right, that risk supersedes, and this is so important, that risk supersedes the other risk. Now, I'm not the only one <laughs> that is aware of that. Um, and so what I am saying is that yes, inflation is the number one priority after dealing with the external threat. We have two external threats now, not just one. Uh, we actually have three. Hopefully COVID is a shorter term thing. We have the longer term threat that's accelerating on climate change. And we have uh, another uh, Another one out there that's uh, I'll have to talk a bit more openly about, and that is the uh, accelerating or increasing uh, political threat with China and the U.S. Let's face it, that's growing. A lot of people are concerned about it, uh, I would assume, well, I know, in China, and uh, certainly in the U.S. And uh, because of this, it's important to keep the, the economic and financial stability uh, important in both of those contestants. No matter if we want to disagree on everything else in the world, and we do disagree on many things, uh, we have to keep economic progress going if it costs something on inflation, all right, it's going to cost something on inflation. And we're going to, 2% uh, is, is good talk for the markets. But the reality is when the underlying pressures start to show 3%, uh, but we're not there yet, well, it's all right. We'll stomach it. Uh, because of the bigger threats out there. How about when it gets to 3%? Well, then we'll start to take some actions. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Will they be sufficient to stop the inflation based on the lessons of history? No. Trying to, to use Mr. Martin's terminology to take the punch bowl away just when the party's getting going uh, uh, you better take it away early enough or it's too late. Uh, and that is, I think, what many people in the U.S. markets, uh, what I am very, very focused on. All the more reason, all the more reason when you're selecting uh, items for the portfolio with the awareness that the liquidity might not always be there that you better have credits that are strong enough under the currently changing and anticipated changes in the structure of the supply chain, in the structure of the reorganization of how retail runs these days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, and uh, it may not be that this boom in demand for paper board <laughs> to wrap packages in uh, continues. Uh, but we, we, this world is changing so fast. 
But as the risk of inflation, do I think it's high? Yes, I do. When will it be high? Well, it's high now, but it will become observable in possibly two years or less or three years. And that depends pretty much on how successful we are on controlling uh, COVID, not just locally, but internationally, worldwide. It's got to be yeah, controlled. I, I really agree with Bill Gates on this. I, I really do. I, I'm on the same page with him. Sure. So, uh, so Dan, uh, on the subject of uh, inflation, I mean, you have referred to uh, the return of inflation and uh, the way uh, we need to, you know, look at uh, uh, you know, when the Fed will act and all that. So um, a lot of the hypothesis in the markets today is uh, actually dependent on exactly that particular question that you have, uh, that you keep referring to. And if you really see the U.S. fixed income yield curve today, you have a two-year bond trading at, say, 0.15 or 0.10 percent. And you have a 10-year bond, which is trading at around just 90, 95 basis points, 0.9 to 0.95 percent. And when you look at the Fed uh, uh, policy and the Fed minutes and the dot plot, uh, the median assumption of all the Fed uh, governors is for uh, the uh, uh, for a rate hike not to happen till end of 2023, which means they are kind of giving confidence to the market that they are going to be at the current uh, neutral rate of interest for the next three years. And in fact, yesterday, uh, Mr. Powell in his statement, I think, referred to the fact that they continue to they're going to continue to be accommodative till the time they uh, achieve unemployment and uh, rather achieve employment and inflation targets which they have set for themselves. So the key question is, do you believe in these uh, expectations that in the next three years we won't see interest rates going up? And when do you think, uh, you know, the employment objective uh, and the inflation objective of the uh, Fed would be achieved in the next three years? Markets this time seem to be believing what the Fed uh, is actually indicating. Before COVID, there always used to be a difference between the, what the markets were pricing in and what the Fed was saying. And we always used to track the difference. This time around, it seems that almost everybody seems to be believing that there is absolutely uh, 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 belief in what the Fed is saying, that for the next three years, there's not going to be much of inflation and they're going to keep interest rates very uh, low. So what's your uh, answer to that? Sorry, it was a very long question, no, but... No, but they, you phrased it perfectly well. And the chairman yesterday, watching him on TV, um, you know, was very reassuring along that point. He didn't want people to worry about the Fed backing away. So there is very, very broad agreement on that. And nearly unanimous. I say nearly unanimous. I, I'm not in the same uh, camp. I do okay. agree, I strongly agree, that the overriding concern right now for the Fed is we've got to deal with the here and now. And we need, this market needs support. People need confidence. There are too many uh, difficulties and too many uncertainties. I agree with that. And I will not be surprised if that is accurate. I will not be surprised if the Fed might want to even run it a bit beyond that. Nor will I be surprised if for some reason, uh, some of the geopolitical tensions uh, subdue a tiny bit. Uh, not the way to bet, but I won't, wouldn't be surprised if they come down under the U.S. new U.S. administration. Uh, that the Fed might remember the lessons of history. Uh, and say, well, you know, 
we better stick with the 2%. Let's not let it run to three. Let's not overplay our hand. Nor will I be in the least bit surprised. In fact, I anticipate a, a, a pickup in renegotiation uh, of a lot of corporate credits. Uh, and in particular in the uh, admittedly uh, lower credit rating areas. Uh, you have to be very, very careful because if any, for any reason, some of this liquidity uh, in the markets starts to be absorbed by uh, the economy as it eventually starts strengthening, hopefully, uh, if it starts to work its way out of the markets and into the real economy, at that point, it's difficult to describe, but at that point, as the real economy strengthens and absorbs capital on a more permanent basis, and you get a slight uptick, the base rate, uh, as you outlined uh, quite accurately, uh, is there. The spreads along the base rate have come down down, down, down. Uh, so while, and yet they're still in the reasonable range, but they're in a reasonable range relative to a very different environment. They're not in a range at the lower end on the credit side is the best example. Uh, you have a, a, a fundamental discount rate you have to put in there on credits for the chance of interruption in their ability to pay. Not, not just principal, but also income. Uh, and uh, where I would use a, a number of say 4% four, four at some of the, or, or higher, depending on the individual credit, uh, on more on the, the chance of your credit side, uh, the markets, are not pricing that in at all because what people forget is okay you may buy that at say uh four percent uh yield advantage and normally that that's okay uh-huh relative to normal in the issuance uh what's happening each year it's not a satisfactory amount because the inability to pay on the issuer's part will happen two or three years from now. When it happens, uh, then you'll say, well, oh, okay, uh, that 4% should help. Yeah, it helps a little bit, but the dollar price on the principal is now 50 and you're not receiving income or the dollar price is 30. We just went through a period like that the, uh, you know, earlier this year. Uh, with uh, in the energy area. Uh, and certainly that's emerging now in retail issuance. So uh, I've just been handed a note by my chief, <laughs> direct superior here that I have five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, Dan, let me try to squeeze in maybe two questions if you are lucky. Uh, so the first one is uh, kind of a very interesting uh, question and it says, uh, uh, do you see the current trends in the US domestic politics as a threat to the American capitalist economy? Uh, maybe you want to even touch upon the kind of fiscal policy that uh, the government is possibly going to embark upon when the Senate elections happens uh, next month. You could possibly touch on that as well. Uh, I do see it. I am one of those who are, are quite worried about the divisions. Wow. They're not within is notable within states. Now, I live in Massachusetts. I would say, you know, we happen to have a Republican governor with 80% of the population being registered Democrats. <laughs> so this is a very, very, very centrist state. Uh, and uh, where some of the other states, uh, it, it's more of a sharper divide. But I, I think it is definitely a threat. I, I think... Uh, the depending on the outcome of the Georgia election, uh, the Democrats might have both 
uh, not just the House, but the Senate also, although they don't hold the House strongly as they did. Quite interesting. Uh, the president himself is very much a centrist. There, is, there are divisions within the Democratic Party, uh, and one group, quite notable, quite vocal, uh, is uh, would scare anybody in the fixed income markets. <laughs> they they would like to you know distribute the money, yes, but uh, not necessarily have pay for it uh, or let's change change the structure of the incremental tax rate on individuals based on income to be a very, very sharp uh, line so that the rich pay a much heavier rate, et cetera. Things along that line. Uh, okay. Something yeah. like, uh, so that that's a real risk. Okay. Uh, and uh, the Fed's aware of that. And that is another factor that they will never, ever, even over the luncheon table, discuss with uh, some of us old folks uh, when we do have those lunches. Uh, but they're yeah. concerned with that because it got out of hand in the 1970s. And... Uh, God rest him, I happened to have a couple conversations with Paul Volcker his last year. Uh, and uh, the only thing, I, I never talked to him about this, but he was uh, a permanent member of the Open Market Committee all through the 70s. And then he was called to be chairman and he was promoted to sheriff. Okay. <laughs> They said, Sheriff Volker stopped the inflation, and he did. Okay, sure. Not until mm -hmm. a lot of damage had been done. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, Dan, we are uh, having hardly a couple of minutes now, or maybe a minute to go. Uh, so, um, I'll ask you uh, something that is very, very contemporary and contextual, which is about Brexit. Since you have spoken so much about uh, geopolitical uh, risk and... Uh, uh, this uh, deal negotiations which are going on between the UK and the European Union, uh, I mean, I think they're running short of time. Maybe in another 10 days, they have to come out with a deal. And if, if, they, if the Brexit happens with a deal, there's going to be a risk on in the market. If they don't, there's going to be risk off. So what is your parting shot in terms of uh, what do you think is going to happen, Brexit with deal or without deal? I don't know what the outcome will be there, but it's a walking disaster if it happens. It would be a terrible impact. Uh, and you'd have to take it into account on analyzing all of the credits involved in, uh, in, in England. And um, it would be hard on the, it would be a very difficult burden for the, gov the government to carry forward. It, it, it really would be very, very uh, economically uh, hurtful, in my opinion, it's my opinion, to England. And it wouldn't okay. help, it wouldn't help Europe either, but it'd be a disaster for England. Okay, sure. So, uh, so Dan, that's, uh, that's great. In fact, let me just try one last question, if you can reply in 30 seconds. Somebody has asked, what's your view on Bitcoin? So do you really track Bitcoin? Do you have a view on that? <laughs> My view is highly uncertain. I, I, I'm not a fan, but I don't... Well, we'll wait and see. Ask me that in about two years. Okay, okay. All okay. right. Okay, sure. So um, uh, uh, thanks a lot, Dan. That was a, a wonderful uh, session. I mean, you took us on a tour of uh, uh, US, China, Russia, UK, all kind of geopolitical risks and what all investors should actually uh, look at and the dilemma between uh, the vaccine and the uh, uh, Fed uh, pumping in liquidity. So 
uh, it is uh, very enlightening and uh, thanks a lot uh, dan again for a wonderful session i really hope that the audience uh, 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 found it really interesting uh, so uh, i am now turning it back to ravi uh, ravi uh, over to you <laughs>